Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to ODI. I am Sara Pantuiano, I'm the head of the Humanitarian Policy Group here at ODI. I'm really delighted to welcome you to our second annual lecture. HPG started these traditions of the annual lectures last year. We had the inaugural lecture delivered by Yves Dacour, the Director General of the ICRC, uh, who reflected on the changing humanitarian landscape, in particular on uh, how the ICRC is adapting to um, providing assistance and protection to communities affected by conflict and violence uh, in the changing landscape of humanitarian action. The focus of tonight's lecture is on the failure to respond to the challenges of today's humanitarian action in violent environments. We're really honored to have with us Jerome Oberreit, the Secretary General of MSF, um, who will reflect on the <coughs> challenges that MSF is facing in uh, operating in violent environments. Jerome will focus in particular on Syria, but we'll also touch on CAR, on Central African Republic. MSF has been very vocal in trying to highlight the situation in CAR, so Jerome will touch on that. But the idea is to really stimulate debate about some of you know, the challenges the NGOs in particular are facing in working in some of these environments today, and the type of compromises they're forced to make to be able to respond to the needs of communities on the ground. And I think you know, Jerome's lecture will help us also think a little bit about you know, the, the wider challenges of the human facing the humanitarian system today. Um, Syria in particular, I think, really um, strikes me as being a defining moment um, for us. And I think the failure, of, you know, the failure to respond in Syria is really becoming um, the defining issue of this generation of humanitarian action. And Jerome, you'll help us think a little bit about this. Before Thank I you give you the much. floor, I want to introduce you. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Jerome is the Secretary General of MSF. But I want to tell you a little bit about Jerome and why he's well placed to help us you know, navigate through the complexity of these issues. Jerome has been with the MSF since 1994. Um, he's worked in a variety of environments, uh, um, Kenya, Somalia, Sierra Leone, uh, <coughs> occupied Palestinian territories, um, until he went back to the operational center of MSF in 2001 and became the, head, the, the director of operations in 2006. And then in 2012, took up the position of Secretary General, which means that he directs the Office of MSF International. Before I give you the floor, just to remind you that the hashtag for those who are on Twitter of tonight is uh, HPG Lecture. Um, Jerome will talk for about half an hour, and then we will take questions from the audience, as well as the live audience, which is very numerous tonight. So we'll be taking questions both through Twitter and through the live chat. Sharon, we're really delighted to have you with us tonight. Thank well, you very thank much. Thank you very much, Sarah. <laughs> thank you very much, Sarah, and uh, good, evni good evening. And I really want to thank ODI, uh, the Humanitarian Policy Group, for the opportunity to speak here tonight. Uh, HPG and the Humanitarian Practical Network tackles topics of direct interest, obviously, to us at MSF. And the work that uh, comes out of, um, of ODI is certainly appreciated in terms of the quality, but also we strongly appreciate these kind of events where we can share and discuss. It's the first time for me, but uh, I'm sure I will also appreciate this evening with you tonight. Um, we find the insight that we've gained from your publications actually very important for our operations, but also for our reflection around the policies that we develop. And also we are honored to be part of the H. PG's advisory group, and believe me, it's quite rare for MSF to be part of any board. <laughs> um, and so uh, it's, uh, it's again an honor for us to be able to engage as you, uh, with you on your board. As an operational organization, obviously we are not a policy-orientated NGO, we are not an advocacy outfit, but we still dedicate a lot of time to research, and in particular medical research. However, we also tackle, and it's important for us, humanitarian issues. Early next year, we will be publishing something very relevant to the lecture tonight, uh, our reflections on emer emergency response capacity for the humanitarian aid system through HPG in a uh, network paper. We've uh, also just published a new edition of the Practical Guide to Humanitarian Law, again, very important in terms of working in conflict settings. And uh, very interestingly, I think for a lot of people interested in how MSF has vocalized some of the issues and problems over the years, we're putting online our speaking out case studies. Now these are uh, studies that provide an insight into the public positioning decisions that MSF has taken historically. 
it's quite strange that for public positioning, these publications, which we've done over the years, were only available internally. It's a bit of those, one of those strange things. We talk about uh, public positioning, but we keep all the lessons for ourselves. So now we've decided to actually publish them online. The first publication has been on Somalia, which was a period of 90 to 93. And we're just putting online now the Ethiopian experience of uh, the 80s. And we will publish three case studies on the Rwandan genocide to coincide with the 20th uh, year's commemoration early next year. Also of importance to this lecture, and I'll end with this one, our kind of uh, publicity bit about <laughs> what MSF does, is uh, the, the book that was published in 2012 on humanitarian negotiations revealed. And uh, you know, for anyone interested in how MSF approaches the compromises and conflicts, it's really a blunt and trans transparent account on how MSF uh, deals uh, with violent conflicts, with, uh, um, with uh, also some of the acute uh, health gaps we had to face and how we've negotiated with different uh, parties involved. But uh, first, I would like to start with the title of the, of the lecture tonight about the failure to respond. Failure is an important and a striking word. And when discussing failures, we need to be clear in terms of who this failure should be allocated to. As NGOs, we cannot compensate for the gross failures in the global politics. States have responsibilities to protect and provide, not NGOs. If, as humanitarians, we are responding to a given crisis, it is already due to a failure for whatever reasons, capacity, unwillingness uh, to provide active aggressions by those that have a direct responsibility, first and foremost governments, but also those that control given territories or populations. As NGOs, while we may feel that we are failing individually in our task to, response, to respond, these are not political failures that can be measured against conventions or defined mandates. These failures are what presents us with the monumental tasks and challenges we face in countries like Syria and the Central African public, uh, Republic. These challenges are clearly in our realm, how they have evolved and made us evolve in our response. Linked to those challenges are the dilemmas of compromises that we're each constantly making individually when trying to deal with a given situation. I want to highlight, therefore, both the failures of those that have direct responsibility, but also identify the challenges and compromise we, as MSF, are making uh, in front of these failures. Clearly, 2013 has been a very challenging year for MSF. Unfortunately, I think I've said this in 2012 and probably 2011 as well. But this year really has been challenging. We all know that medical humanitarian action is limited by external constraints. We also know that they are limited by political environment linked to access, security, but also environmental constraints. But they become harder to accept when they are met head on by a complete gap between the needs and the ability to respond in crises of exceptional proportion. The dilemmas faced in trying to deliver assistance to people in extreme need in a meaningful way have been particularly acute in a number of settings in 2013. And it's been one of those years for us where we seem to have encountered our limits and at times struggled to maintain and adapt to some key contexts. It is, however, important to note that challenges and failures to respond not only happen in violent settings. As a medical organization, we are also very concerned about the constant setback we see in the gains made over the past years in diseases such as HIV and TB. Bending the curve of the HIV epidemic is within our reach. The demonstration of the past 10 years has shown how HIV can be treated as a chronic disease, but also <coughs> contained as an epidemic. This is all fantastic news, yet the fight to ensure resources are mobilized and funding sustained remains far from over. Lives are lost every day due to this lack of sustained commitment by governments, both donor and governments facing the brunt <coughs> of the epidemic. The full catastrophe of TB, and in particular multi-resistant TB, and extreme resistant TB is not recognized by policymakers across the world, and mobilization far too slow. Treatment re regimens are cruelly ill-adapted, painful for patients, while far more effective molecules with fewer side effects are in the pipeline, but far too slow to being made available to those who need them most. There is good news for those of you sitting here today in this room. Should the UK face a high prevalence of MDRTB or XDRTB, you can be sure that the drugs will be rolled out tomorrow. It's the economics of medicine that remains a huge challenge. The failure to address the fatal imbalance between the wealthy and the less wealthy states takes its toll. 
But it is not the policy makers, it is the people who are sick and dying who pay the highest price. But back to the subject at hand today, which is the failure to respond in violent settings. This year, we have been forced to take the painful decision to close all our programs in Somalia. In view of the large operational presence we had, the needs in Somalia and the gap left behind, this decision was and remains extremely hard to swallow and digest for us. In work in Somalia over the last decades, we endured loss of colleagues, 16 in all. We endured multiple kidnappings, the most recent lasting 21 painful months. In the end, what pushed us to make this decision is an environment of complete tolerance, even support, the total disregard of both what we provide, what we are, and of our personnel. This total disregard by leaders and authorities on all levels is what led to the failure in our negotiations for the needed operational space. <coughs> the reality is that we no longer had the ability to assess, through, uh, to assess the areas in greatest need. We could no longer negotiate our own protection, but had to pay for armed protection. The huge gap left after our departure is the failure of those in power to recognize the necessity and the value of quality medical provision. The degree of compromise to negotiate access, access simply became too big. While we had operated in more acute peaks of violence in Somalia, we had never operated in an environment where the very actors that guaranteed our security were either complicit or tacitly accepted the abuse of the medical services we were providing. Despite how difficult it has been to leave, given the vast unmet medical needs, we simply had no choice. By contrast, in the Central African Republic, we were able to significantly increase our response in 2013. Today, CAR is one of our main emergency priorities, with a budget nearing 30 million euros and over 100 international staff and 1,000 Central African colleagues. The limitations in CAR is not the external ability to act, but rather our limitations in terms of our own finite resources. The issue in terms of failing to respond is the lack of attention and desperately needed support from the outside world. In particular, the UN system and donors. This really typifies the forgotten context. The situation has escalated beyond anything we had seen in the past. Executions, populations fleeing for their lives into the bush, all this on top of an already existing emergency of chronic conflict and extreme health provision gaps. Today we witness a dramatic escalation in the violence as political differences are pitting communities against one another, often using, using religious differences. The failure in the Central, Central African Republic is one of protection and of donor mobilization more than operational know-how, access or capability. CAR is one of those forgotten crises where political interest is only generated due to peaks of extreme needs. <coughs> too little, too late. At best of times, mortality figures in CAR are equal or beyond emergency thresholds, with life expectancy at 48 years. In CAR, this room would have much fewer participants. But today I want to focus on the, dis the discussion on the di dilemmas faced in adapting to conflict and will concentrate on Syria. It has been the largest failure in terms of our response to the extreme needs of the civilian population. The gap between needs versus response is shocking. We are not satisfied and simply unable to respond to the emergency in the way we should. It makes this an interesting topic for this audience in that Syria is also generating in MSF the majority of our debates, divisions and disputes. This is no surprise, as we have not found the key in how to answer to the massive needs we face in Syria today. In brief, our activities inside Syria, along the northern border, are extremely challenging. Due to the exposure to risk, we constantly question our relevance in front of the impact when compared to the needs and the scale and what we can do in face of that, uh, the, the needs of the people inside Syria. Focusing on Syria, I will look at three main areas. What are the compromises and how they are part of our daily reality? But how do we approach these compromises when they touch our operational principles of impartiality, independence and neutrality? And how does this impact our ability to be relevant aid actor and provide to the victims of these conflicts? In adapting to a context, 
how are we willing to move outside of our normative operational paradigm and how do we ensure we do not lose ourselves in this process? What is the thin line that differentiates a direct service provider from an enabler for others to act? And when or under what circumstances is crossing such a thin line acceptable to an organization like MSF? Finally, how should we communicate and do meaningful témoignage or bearing witness while managing our public positioning when we choose to speak out in such hyper-politicized environments, particularly when the way we're forced to work on one side undermines the perception of our neutrality and impartiality. As this audience is well aware, the crisis in Syria has deeply marked not only serious people, but also made clear the stark limitation of the responsibility of humanitarian actors. The scale of the conflict and the loss of life, displacement, <coughs> resulting in humanitarian needs in such a short time span is unprecedented in recent history. Today, there are 9 million people in need, including 4 million internally displaced and 2 million refugees, tens of thousands detained or unaccounted for, and countless killed, injured, and traumatized by violence and indiscriminate bombing. The sad reality on the ground in those is that those most in need in this conflict are, not, are the ones that are the most deprived of any humanitarian assistance. As enclaves with combatants are under siege, civilians are caught in the middle and cut off many forms of life-saving assistance and direct independent witnessing. The northern border regions are only accessible for medical relief through border crossings operations, a form of access formally recognized by few and only tacitly tolerated by the surrounding states. Civilians are trapped, terrified, under fire, and, constantly and constant bombardment, for the most part totally deprived of their basic right to medical care. This conflict has been characterized by extreme violence, co-optation of humanitarian aid by a myriad of, in of international political actors with individual interests, negatively impa impacting the ability inside Syria to dialogue with all parties to the conflict. Blockage of aid provision by the government from the onset of the conflict, and most disturbingly, there has been systematic targeting, including intimidation, murder, detention, torture of healthcare providers. Medicine is at best a casualty of war, but in this context has clearly become an instrument of war. While everyone rightly celebrates the destruction of Syria's chemical arsenal and the unprecedented access weapon inspectors have gained, there is little cause for celebration regarding any significant gains in the relief efforts. It is profoundly disturbing when arms inspectors gain access to sites affected by chemical weapons while medical relief remains blocked for the very populations affected by those weapons. Inspectors cross front lines while doctors tending to victims of violence are shot or bombed. In Syria, two different aid responses have developed from the international aid community, both facing their own constraints and having to deal with daily compromises in how assistance can be delivered. One, the official channel and tightly controlled by the government and accessing mainly government areas. And the second, mainly in opposition held areas, that aid workers must enter from neighboring countries, mainly from Turkey, by what are unofficial, unofficial and precarious routes to access some of the most needy areas. <coughs> MSF's experience, direct experience, is exclusively through cross-border operations and mainly, although not exclusively, to areas controlled by the opposition. Damascus has consistently denied MSF access through the official road. This does challenge our perceived neutrality in this conflict, hence the importance to recognize that this chosen exclusive operational access is by default and not by choice. Our choice would be to access people in need through both routes, cross-border and Damascus. Still, MSF has managed to carve out an operational space and get aid into those that need, desperately need it in the opposition-controlled areas. Our staff are now working in northern Syria directly in a classic setup with international and nationals on the ground in the districts of Aleppo, Raqqa and Idlib, with teams running six hospitals and four health centers and outreach operations. From June 2012 through to June 2013, MSF uh, did more than 50,000 consultations, 
close to 3,000 surgical procedures and assisted 1,000 births inside Syria. We're also in neighboring countries where we've provided 140,000 consultations for Syrian refugees. And we work via carefully constructed partnerships with networks of Syrian medical doctors. To reach areas beyond the front line and in government control zones or in opposition enclaves uh, which are beyond our access. We cannot send our international teams to work with, um, uh, with those networks due to the security concern or the lack of access. The security concern not just for us, but mainly for those doctors. We have expanded this program, begun only two years ago, supporting Syrian net medical networks. And today, they are supporting some 30 hospitals and 60 medical posts throughout Syria. This year alone, we have donated some 200 tons of medical supplies to uh, areas in urgent need. But to be clear, this is a drop in the ocean, and this is also a, also a way which we don't usually operate in. While the notion of advancing deeper into Syria still is a goal, we remain frustrated by our inability to reach those most in need. Today, we are not in the besieged cities. No one is, or enclaves where people are in the most desperate need of medical care and other forms of aid. We take huge risk for the little we do directly, and we struggle with the implication of indirect work. As I've already touched on, MSF faces many dilemmas in Syria, and I'd like to talk more with you about four of the overarching ones. They mainly are, one, the systematic targeting of medical actors, two, cross-border operations unrecognized and criminalized, and three, being there matters, but at what costs. Four, working through medical networks. So first, my enemy's doctor is my enemy. The systematic targeting of medical actors and infrastructure. Well, this is not new. Since its founding, MSF has faced different forms of violence against its staff, patients, health facilities, and medical uh, vehicles. But also, we have witnessed targeting of national health systems in general. The current situation in Syria is a forceful reminder of how health systems can become the targets of attacks and how medical practice can be perverted for political purposes. This violence deprives entire communities of vital assistance and is a means for those involved in the conflict to exert both symbolically and practically their power over people's lives. In this conflict, the doctors and the hospitals are perceived as a threat to be brought down. They represent the possible preservation of the enemy's human resources. Indeed, an experienced emergency doctor that I know well with huge conflict experience when working for MSF in, in Syria tells me that he was advised for his personal security to tell people he was a journalist rather than a health professional. This is emblematic of conflict. This is an em emblematic conflict in terms of the dangers of being a healthcare provider today in Syria. The act of seeking care or providing it is seen as an act of insurgency against the state. The principle of humaneness is completely denied or is only evoked as a form of leverage on the logic of war. How can, these dynamics, how can these, those dynamics be countered or simply limited? How can we get those involved in war to acknowledge the principles of reciprocity, that a place where care is administered benefits everyone and its preservation is clearly understood as one of mutual interests? The second and no less difficult dilemma we face in Syria today, as mentioned earlier, is cross-border operations, today unrecognized and criminalized. While we can only support international efforts to access the enclaves and enlarge the space of maneuver inside Syria, which is mostly currently denied, those efforts present a major red flag. They ignore the issue of cross-border and do not intend to challenge Damascus' hard line concerning the distribution of relief into opposition-controlled areas from Turkey. While the government is being portrayed as making progress in implementing the October presidential statement, the UN obstacles to the main obstacle to delivery of aid in opposition-controlled areas is still portrayed as the opposition, it opposition itself. But it is certainly not our experience. Our main ob ob obstacle is the lack of active support and facilitation to cross-border operations by international institutions. And this is clearly our number one constraint today in how to operate in northern Syria. 
The reinforcement of the aid effort through Turkey needs to be urgently developed in parallel to the lifting of government blockades on the enclaves. Discussion with Damascus to gain authorization to work in government-held areas has been painfully slow and full of mixed messages. Effectively, our cross-border operations are clearly seen as a violation of the government's sovereignty over its own territory. It is safe to assume that our cross-border operations and public communication about atrocities committed <coughs> in war are perhaps not entirely appreciated by the government in Damascus. We will continue to negotiate with the government, or try to, in order to access victims of this conflict via Damascus. And if access is granted, we will face the dilemmas of those currently present in Damascus and need to measure when such tight control on our activities will be too limiting. In addition, the presence in Damascus will most certainly complicate our relationship with the opposition groups, a relationship requiring constant renegotiation to ensure we maintain the operational space we have carved over the past two years. Being on one side of the conflict is an uncomfortable position to be in. But the inability to provide to areas under government control should not be mistaken <coughs> as having chosen a side. Both forms of access are extremely complex and difficult to operate in and leads to compromises. It is our role as humanitarian actors to recognize the difficulties and compromises and avoid a biased reading of the current reality for the sake of both the people we, we want to assist and those trying to assist them. I come to the third dilemma, being there, but at what cost? For MSF, being on the ground is the way we work. Independent international workers help maintain impartial decision-making and independence in our witnessing. They are outside the conflict and decision-makers idly shield, and as decision-makers idly shield their national employees from the consequences of making impartial decisions in highly politi politicized conflicts. As we are all well aware, in armed conflicts, the pressure is tremendous on all those involved in the aid effort. <coughs> it is not only a question of treating patients that walk into the emergency room uh, in an impartial way, it is also the ongoing <coughs> definition and evolution of our programming that requires this impartiality. In addition, it is the proximity of our international fr staff to the reality of the people we seek to assist that drives us as an organization pushes us to go the extra mile in the extreme situations we face, both in terms of providing aid and in terms of speaking out. In Syria, our classic programs seem like an island to us. As stated, we're unable to work in the besieged enclaves where we would be of, most great va of, of greatest value. With the shifting front lines and increasing splintering of radicalization of some groups, negotiating our operational space is increasingly complex. Kidnapping of journalists and aid workers are now a feature of the context in northern Syria, and this has meant increased security measures and fewer movements. Threats are common and cannot be taken lightly. And in one case, an MSF Syrian surgeon disappeared and was let, later found executed. It seems for resisting tendencies of local groups. Being there matters, but at what price? At the same time, there is an increased depiction of the chaotic terrorist-ridden north that echoes the rhetoric of the global war on terror. Regardless of ideology of armed actors in conflict, working on the ground is a question of negotiation with all armed parties that control the area. No ideology is by nature more or less dangerous to our operations, provided they understand and come to respect the importance and value of impartial medical aid. This brings me to the fourth dilemma, the question of working through medical networks. Prior to our international staff working inside Syria, we began operations through networks of Syrian healthcare workers, with whom we built a strong relationship of trust. Our ambition was to develop direct cross-border programming, as it was clear that the traditional humanitarian aid actors and aid system would not be allowed entry via Damascus and across front lines to reach those we felt most in need. At the time, MSF, along with a few other international organizations, began to start working in this matter, in manner across the border and using underground networks. And this was clearly against the wishes of Damascus. It is worth noting that today this has changed and there are significant amount of material and technical support being offered via NGOs across the border. 
This operational choice of indirect working was in large part due to the concerns of the safety of the Syrian doctors working on the front line through these networks. Internationals would render their networks of healthcare more visible, hence more vulnerable. Invisibility was, and still is, their best form of protection. Invisibility has become a precondition for a large part of the humanitarian medical response in Syria today, at great personal risk to those which provide this aid. As soon as significant areas in northern Syria were under opposition control, MSF was able to expand its work and begin operating directly in a direct manner as we do today with international staff and Syrian staff working and running hospitals and clinics together. While this has not been the first time we have worked in a more uh, supportive way to networks, we do see that this indirect manner as an exceptional way of approaching our operations. Syria today is an exceptional conflict in terms of level of violence people are facing the sheer scale of individuals affected, and the lack of access humanitarian organizations have. This is in large part due to the targeting of medical and the hyper-politicization of the region. Hence, the exceptional choice we have taken in the early phase of the conflict with this indirect operational approach. For an organization like MSF, who is not a donor organization, but rather a direct implementer, and one that truly believes that in conflict, international staff have a specific added value, how long do we choose to maintain part of our programming in this very indirect manner? <coughs> how do we conceptualize our relationship with these medical networks? Well, we have innovative ways and means of monitoring uh, from a distance, training and offering technical support. We do not have the same level of assurance in the way medical provision is given once it reaches the destination. We fully recognize the compromises we are making in terms of the perception of the impartiality of our programs. For some in MSF, this kind of work has been called blind, and it's seen as a step too far, representing an unacceptable compromise. We have ample experience in context of violence and are not naive regarding the degree of manipulation and how this risk is increased the further we are from where the care is delivered. We accept and recognize the compromise and do our best knowing that we, have, that we have what we consider to be a reliable partners and no other ways of reaching people um, facing a complex lack, a complete lack of medical assistance. Until our medical teams are able to negotiate greater access to the hardest hit areas of Syria, we have little choice but to work in what we consider to be an acceptable compromise. Linked to the, this dilemma of working through medical networks comes the question of witnessing. On the 21st of August 2013, we received direct information from doctors we were supporting with material and technical advice in three locations in the El Ghouta region, in the suburbs of Damascus. The information was coherent and triangulated. It followed epidemiological patterns consistent with the use of neurotoxins. These doctors had directly cared for people affected by what we now know to be chemical weapons. There was little space to question what happened. A heated internal discussion on what to do with the knowledge of this horrific attack took place. Should we go public with this information? How could we better support the Syrian colleagues providing care to the victims? How could we better support, uh, what would be the consequences of our positioning for patients networks and the broader operations. Some felt the quality of the information was not direct enough. Others that the use of chemical weapons was already in the public area and that MSF had nothing new to say. It is important to note that the international MSF medical team supporting the networks, the doctors that had been in first line contact by Skype with their Syrian counterparts wanted to go public. They could not accept silence in the face of such an extreme event, an, e an event that by definition made no distinction between civilians and combatants, and also killed first responders trying to assist those affected. We were the most direct independent witness through the doctor-to-doctor -doctor reliable link we had developed in Syria. In this hyper-politicized environment, it made our public statement all the more important in terms of highlighting an escalation in what civilians were facing in a conflict. We decided to go ahead 
and release a press statement explaining that three hospitals MS has supported received approximately 3,600 patients displaying neurotoxic symptoms in less than three hours, some 300 plus of whom died. We called for an independent verification. MSF is a medical organisation, but our work does not stop at the deliver delivery of care. It is also about speaking out in extreme situations. In Syria, the exceptionality was a chosen way of operating, not the speaking out. In such extreme and exceptional situations, if we, not com if we do not communicate, do we lose our credibility? How do we communicate in a way that does justice to what we witness directly and information that we learn through networks we collaborate with? What are the implications of this on our future access when we are only present on one side of the conflict despite our best efforts? There are no simple answers to these questions and they will continue to challenge us as they have done since the early days of MSF long, long before we started operating in Syria. So in closing, I'd like to ask you, what does the future hold for Syrians caught in the war and for our capacity to respond? As I speak, the future for Syrians looks bleak. Sadly, things have grown progressively worse as another winter sets in. We have limited operations on one side of the conflict and indirectly through networks on the other side of the front lines. Working in highly insecure areas is an increasing, in an increasingly radicalized and fragmented context. We are providing medical assistance in an imperfect way, taking huge risks through these cross-border and cross-line operations, constantly making compromises. There is a need for all humanitarian actors in this hyper-politicized environment to be fully transparent on the compromise each of us are making, on the impact of the political decisions and non-decisions taken by international institutions and the states that make them on the civilian population of Syria. As humanitarians, we cannot accept that civilians are the collateral damage of a political process that disregards the urgent need of an unimpeded, massive medical relief effort from Damascus on the one hand, and does not accept or recognize the urgent need to develop cross-border operations on the other. For those involved in humanitarian work, Syria will be remembered for two things. The failure of politics to enable a meaningful response to the massive needs of people inside the country, and the failure to protect the medical mission, the targeting of life-saving, and the targeting of life-saving medical action. The purpose of the discussion that we will have now is really to question the failures <coughs> in the response, how we have failed to provide assistance to the civilian population in Syria, and how people will continue to endure extreme violence and see no end unless there is a change in how we can access them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerome.